offbeat for a firing line, what you will hear during the next hour, provided you stay tuned. And if you do not tonight, you will not sleep for the shame of it. <clears throat> we even changed the introductory music for the occasion because we propose to examine something that could not have been examined even a couple of generations ago for the lack of technological alternatives, namely the question of live performance for the artist or studio performance. And I propose to use as a springboard for this discussion of Glenn Gould, the late genius who died in 1982, just after his 50th birthday. He was famous for many things, a piano virtuoso, an interpreter, a musicologist, a commentator. But in the theatrical world, he was probably most conspicuous as the supremely successful artist who at age 31 announced that he would not ever again perform in public. Why? Because he said, A, why go through the hassle of public performance when there is the alternative of a recording, and B, why settle for a live performance when, by the aid of recording technology, you can get it just right? Authors can edit their work before publishing it. Painters can meditate and put final touches on their canvases. So why should musicians expose themselves to the vicissitudes of public performance? How about it? And how about the analogs of the musician, the art, if you like? What about the whole idea of spontaneity? Please note that what I have just said is from a text I'm reading from my clipboard. We have with us three guests selected with a jeweler's eye. The first, Rosalind Turek, is in my judgment first and foremost a live performer. This is not to diminish her extraordinary achievements as a scholar, musicologist, analyst, lecturer. It is simply to acknowledge that when at age 10 in Chicago she gave a public concert, she excited her audience even as she continues now to do. At age 12, she was the soloist with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Since then, she has performed on the piano and the harpsichord in every civilized country in the world, and in one or two less than civilized countries, having elected a generation ago to play only the work of Johann Sebastian Bach, her mastery of which is universally acknowledged, and there is a link here to Glenn Gould, as we will see. Scarlett Chapin <coughs> is the dean of the School of Arts of Columbia University. He is preeminently a figure associated with live performances because after apprenticing as an agent and as a musical director for Columbia Records, he became the general manager of the Metropolitan Opera Company. And there is nothing more like a live performance than one that features 150 singers, 95 orchestra players, eight soloists, and at least one prima donna, and occasionally a few live elephants. <laughs> and Tim Page, although he studied Manus and Juilliard, elected not to perform but to criticize. He won in 1983 the Deems Taylor Award for Music Criticism, which he writes as music and cultural affairs editor for the New York Times. He sees both points of view, and last year brought out the, sign, the Glenn Gould Reader, a compilation of the writings of, of Glenn Gould. I quote from the final, final paragraph of his prologue to this book, quote, My most lasting memory of Gould will always be one from our final meeting on a chilly August evening in Toronto, a little more than a month before he died. At three in the morning, we drove to a deserted Midtown recording studio where clad in his usual indoor summer wear, two sweaters, wool shirt, scarf, slouch hat. He relaxed at the keyboard of a Yamaha baby grand and played through his own piano arrangements of Richard Strauss's opera. The Yamaha suddenly became a six-foot square orchestra, dense contrapuntal lines, translucently clear and perfectly contoured, echoed through the empty room, far from the eyes and ears of the curious world, the hungry fans and disapproving critics, the lucrative contracts and percentage deals, Gould played through the night, lost in the sheer joy of creating something beautiful. My first question then directed Mr. Page. Was a part of the beauty you documented, owing to your hearing what you heard, deprived of those who do not hear a perform alive? Well, it's sort of hard to say. I think uh, we will have a chance really, well, I will have a chance to judge that because I've brought a surprise for us today. I've brought a tape of Glenn playing from Strauss's opera, Electra, which is the same thing he played for me. And um, certainly there's some magic to watching a performer there in person. But as for wh whether one serves music more... Um, more completely by playing a live concert which then evaporates into air or into the memories of the people who were there 
or actually spending the time making a recording which is there permanently uh, is something which is open to debate. Well, of course, you can do both. Yeah, you can. But I think the point is that, uh, that Glenn was basically trying to make was, first of all, he didn't enjoy playing live very much. Um, but beyond that... Um, I think we should leave that out mm -hmm. unless, it's a, a, unless you say that he didn't enjoy it to the point of disabling him, which nobody would concede. No, he, he gave wonderful concerts. Yeah. I, I have some wonderful so, live shows. So let's, let's leave out or, or whether or not uh, a person simply doesn't like the fact of whether he's a J.D. Salinger type, mm -hmm. uh, because that really sort of tilts the argument in an individual direction rather than in a general direction. Okay. So, so, so let's use only the arguments that have to do other than with the personal eccentricities of Gregory, uh -huh. right? Uh huh. Okay, that's that's fine. I just mentioned that because I think that may have been partially the mother of invention or the mother of his deduction. Um, oh, so you're abandoning his intellectual case already? No, not at all. Um, I think that may have been one of the reasons why he himself didn't like to give live concerts. Some people joy in live concerts. I think Miss Turek most certainly does. I know Arthur Rubinstein loved doing live concerts. At the same time, I think at this point the most important way to encounter either a composer's work or a performer's recreation of that work is via the media. And I'd like to give one example of this. Um, there was a few years ago when Birgit Nielsen <coughs> sang Richard Strauss's opera Electra at the Metropolitan Opera on this one evening that she sang it. And it was broadcast by television um, on, via the Live from Lincoln Center series. What happened was more people saw that evening, that, that performance of Electra, than the sum total of every man, woman, and child <coughs> who had ever seen or heard Electra since 1908. I remember Leonard Bernstein saying the same thing about Bach's B minor mass back during the Ford uh, hours in the late 50s. That more people would now hear this mm -hmm. than had ever heard it. But uh, I don't think we're disputing that uh, uh, n nobody that I know of wants to put an end to studio technology. Mm -hmm. What we are disputing is whether he makes a point of a kind that ought to put an end to public performances, which is suggested <coughs> in one or two of those essays. Well, we used to disagree about this. Glenn said really categorically that the concert was dead, period. Yeah. And um, I'm a music critic, and I see as many as 10 or 12 concerts a week, so I know it's most definitely not dead. Mm. But I think that it has been replaced. I think that technology has most certainly superseded the concert. Um, well, I want to hear from Ms. Turek and Mr. Chapman. Well, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's, let's run your surprise now. Tell us, tell us again what you brought us. Well, I brought along a copy of uh, Gould playing the final scene from Strauss's Electra, which he made his own, or actually this is not the final scene, this is another scene from Strauss's Electra, which he made his entire, he made his own piano transcription of the entire work because he dearly loved Strauss's music. And we'll hear him playing this. Now, how long does it last? It lasts about five minutes. And my friend Susan Casas gave me a copy of this, which we can watch. It's a film which Glenn made about 1966, about two years after he gave up the stage. And what I find interesting is here we are some three years since Glenn's death, and he's going to be very much with us in just a couple of minutes. Okay. Less than a couple of minutes, I hope. Let's take a look. Well, that was so... <laughs> Nice, I wish it had been a live performance. <laughs> uh, Mr. Turek, what, what, what's your reaction? Oh, by the way, before, is that the piece he played for you three days before he died? No, the piece uh, he played uh, three days before he died was a, a, a Strauss piece called Enoch Arden. It's a piece for narrator based on the Tennyson poem, that long, dreary, marvelous, late Edwardian piece. And we actually made a record of it back in the days when I was at Columbia. Um, because he was one of the very few people who'd ever heard of the piece, number one. And number two, I was one of the very few people who'd ever heard the piece. And so we did it with Claude Rains narrating it and Glenn playing the piano. Um, and so at the last time I talked to him, which was three days before his death, on his 50th birthday, he got um, the telephone close to a phonograph and put it on and said, do you remember this? And I said, I, I hardly think I could forget it. It is, uh, it is uh, infamous or famous, depending upon how you want to look at the piece. Well, uh, 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 Mr. Chair, how do you bounce off of... Uh, Mr. Page is less aggressive than I thought he might be in defending Gould's uh, contention on live performances. 
You, you, you flatly reject the Gould position, don't you? No, I don't flatly reject the Gould position. I think there are many aspects that are involved in what might be called the Gould position, but also outside of the Gould position. I would like to return for a moment to the three fundamental points that were made at the beginning of the program, which had to do with performing in a studio, uh, in line, live performance and alone personally with a close friend or with a few close friends and I would like to say at the outset that in a sense one plays differently in all three activities and so that I don't believe that one can be judged as a whole as an absolute performance uh, in terms of any one of these three why is that so that is of the essence of the artistic process uh, when one plays in a, in a concert hall with an audience, in my view and in all of my life experience, the audience and I um, are really one. The audience is not an entity beyond the stage, hostile or friendly or bloodlusting for whatever they may find to disagree with. And I do not feel myself on a stage separated from them. I do not feel as though I'm playing only here, and there is a, an utterly strange element there with which I have nothing to do. Um, on the contrary, my feeling has always been a communion with the audience. Uh, they are one with this whole experience. Why wouldn't that be so if you were playing for two, three people? Oh, yes, that could be so, but there, when sometimes goes even more <clears throat> inward, uh, and that is a little bit different because there... Yeah, more experimental? There is, it is, no, it is not experimental. Oh, it could be. I mean, that is part of the fun sometimes of playing for a few friends and a few musicians. But uh, basically, if you're playing, if you sit down to play something that you love very much, you believe in very much, and there are two or three friends there, there is that same kind of communion that does occur. Mm -hmm. Um, and it becomes a very inward experience and one plays in a way that is not so often the way one plays in a concert hall and this is one of the reasons why artists and musicians and music lovers like to sit to listen to an artist play in a small room in a private home that has a very special not only external atmosphere but an internal kind of spiritual atmosphere. And what uh, about the third, then? What the, about the... It, it, I just studio. would like to expand oh, a sorry. little on the concert experience because that, to me, is sort of the, the main pillar of the discussion uh, since, firstly, it's gone on for so much longer and because uh, there's so much of it going on. Um, the communication that takes place between myself and my audience, and I like to make that more general, between certain artists who feel this way and the audience is, is something that cannot be measured. I feel that at such moments, one reaches the highest level of communication with human beings. One reaches into their mo innermost thoughts, their innermost spirits, their innermost strivings and aspirations, and this brings you utterly inside of their whole spirit. Is this true in extra, is in extra musical situations? For instance, this audience here, uh, is the fact of their presence here uh, a factor in your performance right now? I wouldn't say that it is a factor in that I am consciously making points for them. No. What is a very important factor to me is not even so much what I'm saying, the quantity or the content, but the quality. I am saying that uh, in talking to you or speaking here, knowing that you are here, I feel a very deep connection with every one of you. I feel a deep connection with each individual. I feel a deep connection with the entire group. And if you were 3,000 people and 500 on the stage just behind me, I would feel exactly the same well, thing. Well, do you feel the same way towards the television viewers? Or is, this, is, is there an that, interruption in that the vibrations is, yes. that you're talking about? There we move into another world. Yeah. That's, that's the, third, uh, the third aspect of, if, of performance. Well, would you consider this a live performance in the sense in which we're talking about live performances? Or would you consider it a studio performance uh, only if you have a chance, say, to edit? 
Um, I, I myself would say it's both. Um, I would draw the analogy perhaps between theater and film uh, uh, is similar to recordings and live, live performances. I think at this point, I, even though I would not agree with Glenn that the concert is absolutely dead, I think it has become an important sidelight rather than the main event. After all, um, more people are reached via the media, and I don't see necessarily anything wrong with a musician taking the time to tinker and perfect a conception of a work to his very best ability. Nobody holds it against, say, a great screen actor who does not want to be on the stage. And I don't really see why Gould, who simply, and I, I do think this is relevant. I'm not bringing this in just to bring in uh, Gould's psychology here. But I think that if somebody does not want to do concerts and somebody wants to concentrate more on recordings, uh, that that should be, first of all, their right. And also, in a funny way, um, I think a more important contribution because Gould is now there for us forever. On film, he's there for us on disc. And um, the fact that he spent the rest of his life working very hard on these creations rather than running to meet the train and running to meet to get on the stage um, is, I think, in the long run, he has left us more than a lot of people who did not record and who trod the boards. Well, Mr. Chapin, uh, in your experience, is there a significant difference between the recorded product of a successful opera singer, say, uh, who also performs on stage, and that of the reclusive type like Mr. Gould? Um, there's a lot of what, is, what we've been talking about here um, that I would like to comment on taking off from that question. <clears throat> when you deal with opera performances, uh, perhaps they are really the only musical performances that are gladiatorial. There is an antagonism, whether it is expressed or not, not an antagonism as much as there is a competition yeah. between the, the, the singer on the stage and the audience. In many instances, and I remember sitting in the auditorium uh, during performances, where you really knew that most of the people there were anxious as to whether the soprano was going to hit the high note, mm -hmm. or the tenor was going to be able to... say nothing of general manager. Yes, <laughs> say nothing, exactly. Um, and you had a, a, an almost sense of combat, uh, a, a sense of tension between the two. Whereas in a recording studio uh, and an opera production made for records, the concentration was upon, is upon, the music and the interpretive part of the artist in reaching out to do that music. So I think in the opera world, you have this unusual situation of a tension in a live performance, which often mitigates against the artist being at his or her best as opposed to working in a studio to record an opera where the musical dramatic content of the piece are all that is an under consideration. Well, that's, that's a fascinating concession. So that the best opera recordings would be of non-live performances. Yes, I, I think so. Now, there are always exceptions to, to, to statements like that. I mean, moments when a performance is captured where in and of itself it will simply never... It just took off. It, it just took off. Yeah, right, right. There is a pirated recording of the Metropolitan Opera only performance, for example, of Tristan and Isolde with Birgit Nielsen and John Vickers. They only sang it seven times uh, during their active lives without opera uh, in the world. And uh, one of the black market been... tape will cost you sixty-five dollars. Yes, yes, it did. <laughs> it did. As a matter of fact, when I when I bought it, I, I went to a, a, a shop that I knew specialized in these things, and I waited several years after my reign at the Met, and I went in and I said to them, "By any chance, do you have a copy of the Nielsen?" Did you wear a mustache? And... No, I didn't. <laughs> the, the, the man looked at me and said, "Mr. Chapin, we've been waiting for you." To come <laughs> So, 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 but, but those are anomalies. Yeah, they? they are. Now, Mr. Terry, um, you, you uh, told me a few days ago that uh, quite by accident you were listening to something that you had recorded 20 years ago and you thought it was magnificent. And, uh, and uh, having heard the same recording, I, I quite agree with you. Now, are you saying that it is uh, better, more electrifying than what you can come out with playing before a live audience? 
Oh, no, not at all, not at all. In fact, I don't think we've considered enough what happens when you're playing before a live audience. Different things happen according to different activities. Well, by the way, do you agree that opera is different from, from uh, recital, recitals? I in think the there is a difference in that you have so many forces there that you're contending with, and uh, there are various tensions between the actual divas and so forth, uh, and Say circumstances that occurred during rehearsal, and the conductor, etc., etc., that there must be all kinds of really extraneous tensions that have nothing to do with the music. Do they dissipate when you go before a studio? Uh, as, I don't, I don't as see why they dissipate. I mean, the, the, a diva is going to be apprehensive about the other diva or jealous of her in a studio or in, at the Met, right? I think that it's the, the situation boils down to this. In a sense, the situation in a studio is less complicated. You come into it's a smaller space, it's a more concentrated activity, everyone comes knowing exactly what they want to do and are going to try to do. Uh, as you said, I would agree thoroughly with you as an artist, even in my field, that one comes with a total concentration and is not distracted by the effect on the audience and the lights going wrong at the wrong time and something happened to your to address or something. And, uh, you know, the odd things, when does the swan come out? The swan doesn't come out at the right time. You know that you will not have that kind of distraction. And one comes really solely for the music. Uh, even right. the, the, and therefore the histrionic aspect is also left out. One doesn't have to worry about how one dashes about the stage in a certain dramatic scene. So the focus becomes pure music, and in that way, I do believe they can give more and their best, uh, unless... Well, what about the arousal yeah. factor that yes. comes in from knowing that an audience is sitting right there in front of you? Well, that, of course, is, I think, the great crux. Mm -hmm. um, when an artist walks out on a stage, one is totally prepared. The adrenals, however, begin to work. I shall never forget, uh, my debut was with the Philadelphia Orchestra playing the Brahms B-flat Concerto, not Bach, with Ormandy. I played uh, at Carnegie Hall and then again at the Academy in Philadelphia. I played the opening concert in New York and the second and third in Philadelphia. By the third concert, which was on a Sunday afternoon, I found myself getting into the car to go on to the Academy the utmost poise, utmost relaxation, and I even yawned as I got into the car. And then I said to myself, well, this really, you, you must kind of pick yourself up here. You I walked out on the stage, I was in complete control. By the third time, there I was. There was none of the, the tension or the, the fear that is associated with the usual stage fright. Now, the general, the general occurrence within an artist is the adrenals do begin to work, and I can almost time them, you know, by a clock before a performance. They, they start to work at least two hours before. You have no control whatever. <laughs> and no matter whether you want to do any conscious exercises uh, with yourself or not. Um, so they, they lead you. Now the point is really to acquiesce because you can't fight them. They're going to win every time. Now this is what happens now, that happen at before a concert, bef before a, c a concert audience. Yeah. Now with a studio audience, that is much more mild. You walk in very comfortably. You have all your music with you. You have the, the piano that you want. Uh, you know that you can redo a passage. Uh, some people redo many, many passages. I know of one very famous artist who performed the C minor Chopin etude in about 3,000 takes. And what he did was... What? 3,000? Yes. <laughs> God. What he did was to play yeah. four measures at a time about 20 or 30 times. And when he finished the four measures all that many times, then he went on to the next four I measures. I that and way. played that <laughs> way. <laughs> and not only that, and when he finished, it was up to the engineer to sift out each four measure portion and I can't believe it sounded them. like a hole. I just can't and believe it. And it came out and it received 
excellent critical review. No and it was praised because it was said that his endurance was phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> he sort of left in one mistake to make it plausible. Well, <laughs> yes, like the Siamese who have one god upside down. Yeah. But the point is that um, it, there is a, so much to be said for studio performance because it is infinitely more comfortable. You are, you are alone. You do not have the hazards of, for instance, in Chicago at, at the Orchestra Hall, all the lights went out. Uh, within a few minutes of my hope. beginning to play. <laughs> and Mar absolutely, Mar I played during the bombs. <laughs> yes, I kept on playing through absolute blackness. Good for you. Uh, well, that's the kind of thing that happens at, at night performances. When you come into a studio... I want you to know I can do that with a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is very interesting, all of what Miss Turek is saying, and I, and, and I know, having spent my life with, with uh, talented people, that she's absolutely right. But there is a curious double whammy uh, in this question. Take, for example, Vladimir Horowitz, who for 15 years, 12 to 15 years, was away from the public altogether, including away from the studio. And back in 1961, I think it was, when we were able to get him out of total retirement and back into the studio, he began to record again on the assumption that there was a generation that probably didn't remember him and he was testing the waters to see what was going to happen. He made some stunning records. A new generation discovered him. He then went out of the studio back to live performances and then back into the studio to record. But very shortly after he discovered a reacquaintance with the atmosphere you have so eloquently described with a large audience with you and the whole interconnection, he then ceased going into the studio to record and only made records of his concerts. So you have, if you will, a mechanical way in which an artist reintroduced himself back to live, back to the studio, abandoned the studio, and only live and mechanical reproductions of live. Uh, well, wait, is that because he needed the adrenaline of a live audience to uh, I asked him once him to about play? this. Uh, it was a question, really, that he felt for his own purposes. The, the position of an audience caused him to be at his peak. Mm -hmm. at his moment of, of giving, whereas in the studio, the temp I gather, I never got quite specific in this, but the implication was that in the studio, the temptation to tinker is, is enormous. Now you got those who Gould tinkered, didn't he? He tinkered a fair amount, but he certainly never did anything like four bars of a piece. Yeah. Um, if somebody responds well to that adrenal um, sensation that we've been discussing, it seems to me that's fine, the same way it's all right if a writer wants to work with a certain kind of pe music on or with in a cork-lined room or something like that. <laughs> what it seems to me we should be judging, though, is the actual product. And we're talking now in New York City, which is the cultural capital of the world, or certainly of America and probably the world. We're two, three miles from Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, and so on. I grew up in a small town in northeastern Connecticut, and I, oh, I think I saw my first opera when I was about 10, but then I didn't see another one until I was about 20. And for me, growing up the whole time, um, and I think for the vast majority of people who do not have the luxury of Carnegie Hall around the corner, that uh, canned music has become, in fact, music, or recorded music, whether on film, whether on tape, whether on disc, whether on the new compact discs, these are music for many people. I was thinking of this the other night because um, I was humming a melody from Berlioz's opera Les Troyennes, and I was trying to think how I knew that melody, and I thought to myself, well, where does that come from? And I couldn't quite remember what act it came from, but I knew it was at the end of side eight of the complete set. Yeah, right. And I think for people who grew up in, in my generation, that that's really become the way we, we hear music. And just the fact that that recording is there forever. If, if people want to give live concerts, uh, you know, it, it's a free country. People should be able to do what they want. And there are often very exciting live concerts, as Mr. Chapin suggests. But it seems to me that the, the really important thing now with music is, is canned music, is the ability to put it down for all time rather than letting it dissipate into air. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'd just like to add to that because I think Mr. Page is making a very important point, and I want to go just two seconds into history. 
Uh, at Columbia Records back um, oh, 15, 20 years ago, um, Goddard Lieberson, who was then president of the company, decided that the recording had an advantage that had not been used to date, which was to actually put down the oeuvre of a composer the way that composer intended the piece to sound. Mm -hmm. You can imagine what might have happened if Bach's day or, or any of the, of the great uh, classical romantic composers had had this opportunity. And so he began with Igor Stravinsky. And he began recording every single work of Stravinsky, either conducted by him or under his supervision. And as each person became responsible for the classical repertoire, we took this on as one of our major assignments. And I had uh, four years of doing this with Stravinsky. And it was an incredibly um, exciting time. It was also an incredibly difficult time because... Is the idea of being to be comprehensive? To be comprehensive, uh -huh. not only to be comprehensive, but so that upon Stravinsky's death, and it is true, that any future student, any future conductor, any future person who is interested to know how he felt his music should sound under his own conception of his work is well, how, now available. How, how could you tell how he wanted it to sound because he might have found a particular uh, performance defective? In but there which was no, case, there was it went no out way. the window. Oh, oh, you threw, threw away what he didn't like? He did indeed. He oh, would be in at every single recording of every single work. And um, that meant that when he put his approval on, yes, this is what I want for Agon, this is what I want for Firebird, or whatever it happened to be, he finally had on the library shelf his own sounds. Now, you must remember, we all must remember, and it gets lost sometimes in, in these kinds of discussion, that music really is the only art that requires middlemen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. between the composer and the realization of those dots, dashes, and notes. Well, uh, so does drama. You yes, actors. but if you really don't like a production of whatever the play is, you can read it. Um, if you have that much well, interest in Well, we can read music, you know. Yes, you we, can read music, we can but read most music people can't read music. It's a marvelous thing. I mean, anyone who is literate in, in the verbal language can read. Uh, uh, plays and anyone who is literate in the simple musical notation can read music and experience the greatness of that music. In fact, in many it's cases, it's my view. That happens not to be true, dear mm -hmm. Mr. Eric. That happens not to be true. To enjoy the music. No, of it's not true that anybody who is who is mildly literate in musical notation can oh. pick up a piece of music and oh. understand it. <laughs> the, the well, perhaps I don't mean mildly that. literate, but the, I believe there is a process in which one can experience the music very deeply by simply by reading it, by studying it as one studies the book. If you're a musician. Yeah, yeah. 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 Obviously one Beethoven could. But I would like very much to comment on what you said about this finality of the, the Stravinsky interpretations. We know that Stravinsky made very important changes in his later works. Yeah, about and that. in his yeah. earlier works, about such textual changes, structural changes, uh, so that the work even had a different framework. Uh, he also uh, used to say that we must do away with the performer. There must be only one way of producing music. The composer's music must go straight onto what would, we would call a tape, so that there is no deviation at all from the composer's notation onto, onto the tape. Indeed, in other words, the inter, in this intermediary okay. is to be erased. And that was a very long, uh, that went on for a very long time. I remember Milton Babbitt saying to me at the time that I was involved with contemporary music, he said, one day we are going to do away with you performers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he quite meant it. I mean, the idea of the electronic music, certainly here, I think might almost be a comparable um, situation and something perhaps worth discussing uh, because mm -hmm. there is thought in the electronic music worlds that, that uh, in a sense, the performer is not necessary at all. And this has been growing since the beginning of the 20th century. Let, let, me, let, me, let me intrude this point. Uh, why, why are we automatically prepared to concede that a composer is the best judge of the performance of his own work? I give you, I give you a story for example. I read a hundred years ago that when Brahms first heard Arthur Nikisch play his C minor symphony, he approached him and said, I didn't believe that this music could sound so gorgeous. Now, wasn't that a tribute to uh, uh, 
to the interpretive powers of what you call the middle man. No question. And it's an enormous tribute, and it is also enormously eloquent of the fact that the composer himself does not have final and absolute ideas yeah, right. on that's, not that's only how to play the work, but even the notes in the work, even yeah. the figurations. I've God knows Bach never heard uh, <laughs> the Goldberg play the way Glenn Gould played it, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting it's necessarily an improvement of the way that Bach heard it, but uh, there's got to be a role that we recognize for the interpreter. It certainly that, does. That liberates him from the, from the uh, direct monitorship of the composer. In fact, I think that that role has been forced upon the interpreter. It's the composer who is much more flexible than, than the general attitude towards yeah, but, the interpreter. But you, you, you went through 23 editions of the Italian concerto and the chromatic mm -hmm. fantasy to make absolutely certain that the person playing it would do the ornamentation exactly as Bach intended to. And uh, the, wh wh why be text. so strict in that mode as opposed to so permissive what I did in your with, other mode? What I did with its 24 manuscripts, and by the way, it has grown to almost 40 manuscripts, I have made a comparative study of, of almost 40 manuscripts of the chromatic fantasy and fugue in order to see what the variants are. And when, when we speak of variants, obviously, these are all written by different scribes, and we do not have an autograph of Bach in this work. So that nobody can say this is absolutely right and that is absolutely wrong. The best we can do is to, to uh, delete those manuscripts um, of, of whom the scribes we are sure and also get some idea of the dating. I have one manuscript that is dated 17. 30, which is a very good date and it makes it a very important manuscript. Well, there are about a half dozen out of these several dozen that are really important. Now, the important thing for us as scholars and as artists and as those who, who wish to find some uh, direct line to the composer and in, in performance and in writing, whatever we're doing, is to study these different manuscripts which show variants uh, all the way through. And then you begin to see how people were thinking. Yeah, it sure. isn't so much the, the that's, specific that's, that's, variant That's a historical itself. inquiry more than an aesthetic inquiry. Oh, right. Right. I don't really think Mr. Chapin was suggesting that um, all recordings should henceforth sound like Stravinsky. And mm -hmm. I agree with you that there are, in fact, some recordings of Stravinsky which I think actually fulfill what I might assume to be his intentions better than he himself had the technique or conducting technique to fulfill himself. Still, it's fascinating to have those recordings, and the recording should be listened to, I think, the same way a score should be analyzed by somebody who's planning to attempt a recording or a performance of it. Uh, that's a good point, and I would add one other thing specifically about that. Um, I remember talking to Stravinsky after he had recorded uh, uh, the Firebird, the orchestral suite of the Firebird, the way he wanted it. And I remember listening to it um, and noting that there was an extraordinary, unchanging rhythmic pattern toward the end where most conductors allow a lot of rubati and all kinds of nonsense. And it was unusual. And I said something to him about it and he said, give me your wrist. And here I stuck it out and he put his finger here and he, then he said now you put here on my pulse and I did and he said that is the way this piece must go it must be as steady as the beat of the heart but the beat of your heart increases as you get excited by the pleasure of the music doesn't it uh, quite right quite right and this is where the danger lies even with composers telling performers exactly what to uh -huh. do Ernest Bloch decided he wanted to write a piano concerto for me and he was going ahead blithely and very happily and all of a sudden he was working already on the second and third movements in Agate Beach in Oregon and he wrote me a, a panicky letter saying you must come to Agate Beach I can't finish the concerto without you. And, uh, and so I did. Tell us what you did. I hide myself <laughs> over to Agate Beach, and he showed me the material, and he wanted me to tell him which figurations would be more appropriate to the music, to the structure, to the framework, to the ease and comfort of, of, the, of the keyboard player. And so the composers have 
often repeatedly consulted with the performer and changed their ideas radically according to the the, the outcome of their com the well, conversation Well, cadenzas would be an excellent example of that, wouldn't uh, it? Well, cadenzas are purely the performer's ideas. Up to they a certain point. Well, did, did, cadenza... Didn't uh, Mozart or Beethoven go back and, re and write, stipulate cadenzas because he was unhappy with what, he, what they had heard? Yes, but yes, well, of course, I'm sure composers can be ha unhappy with you lots of look, cadenzas. You can look hear. at the Library of Congress has the manuscript of the Brahms Violin Concerto, which was written for Joachim. And if you look at that manuscript, it is absolutely fascinating. The changes that Joachim made, mm -hmm. and then the changes that Brahms made on top of Joachim's changes. How do you like that? In that essence, that saying, Abba, my way, please, mm -hmm. uh, in, terms of, in terms of... So like Ezra Pound correcting T.S. Eliot. Uh, <laughs> That's in a way. But for instance, when I played the Aaron Copeland Sonata for, for Copeland, I had worked it out, and... Uh, before I were to play it in public, I certainly wanted to take advantage of a living composer's idea of, of my performance. And I played it through, and he said, oh, that's fine. He said, do anything you like with it. I asked him a question, how, what about this? Shall it be bigger or smaller? Or, uh, do any, what do you feel? Do it as you feel. And this was a major work of some 30 minutes long. Well, were you, in fact, giving uh, a performance that was uh, eccentric? or Except. unusual, or um, were, were you departing from the normal way in which the Scopeland Sonata had been played? Not, I only, I played it according to the structure of the music, worked it out in, in my own... Oh, you hadn't heard anybody else's recording? No, 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 I had uh, not. Uh, 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 uh. Is that a frequent uh, occurrence, Miss Page? Uh, well, it, it's hard to say. I, I'm certainly not meaning to uh, demean the role of a recreative performer uh, when working with a well-known composer's music. Um, I think one learns from brilliant recreative artists of all periods. When I listen to uh, Miss Turek's Bach, or when I listen to Glenn Gould's Bach, or when I listen to Edwin Fischer's Bach, or Wanda Landowska's Bach, I hear very different approaches to the same magnificence. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and, and a different and vantage And each in its own way pleasing. Well, often, yes. Uh, there are, are certain performances of each which I may like better than another. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the real tests of a masterpiece is the ability to withstand many, many different interpretations. I am not one of these literals who thinks there's one oh, true oh, face. Maybe there's another absolutely. way to hear the bolero, I hope. <laughs> 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 well, in fact, there are. I have an old recording of, of Ravel conducting the bolero with um, Ida, the dancer, for whom he wrote this piece. Uh, and she was dancing it on the table. They had devised this thing. She had I'd come to him. That. <laughs> <laughs> there's Bach and on the harpsichord. There's Bach on the piano, which on the organ, some, which, on the organ which some purists disagree, at least with the, the piano. There's also Bach on the Moog synthesizer. I myself think that the switched on Bach recordings are marvelous. And so did Glenn, by the way. He thought they were absolutely brilliant. He thought that Bach was mainly concerned with the structures of his music and um, did not want to deny to this wonderfully structured music the, um, the new interpretations which could only be realized on a piano or even perhaps Does on a Does that mode. mean he'd have had no objection to a 16-foot on a harpsichord? No, certainly not. He would have had no objection at all. As a matter of fact, one of his favorite performances of The Art of the Fugue was for a, clear, uh, was for a saxophone quartet. Yeah. He thought it was absolutely brilliant. And he said that um, he felt that the music was still very much served because these performances did not really violate the essential structural integrity of the music. They changed the colors. Well, if, if that's the case, Mr. Turek, why is it considered infra dig to use a 16-foot in the harpsichord? Oh, there are good reasons. But I'm interested in what you're saying because I suspect that he read my writings because I had been writing and lecturing mm -hmm. on that very point he admired all you my life. And this is my basic uh, foundation. Uh, as far as uh, the study of the music and its expression on di in different media. So this is all very, very deep and very familiar ground to me, and, uh, and I think absolutely as Bach would have liked it, uh, because there are so many examples which I have shown where Bach himself uses the same m music for media of totally yeah. different sonorities. Uh, so if you wanted to do it on the so saxophone, that was okay by uh, uh, For, for Bach, yeah. by Bach, it would have been... To, all right, today, in our more 
classified kind of concept. Uh, we put everything into categories. Everything has an appropriate place. I think today, the 20th century, is trying to put Bach into his place, into his various yeah. single well, they're, places. They're monastic, I think Bach yeah, is a much wider, much more gigantic figure than the kind that is being made of him today who fits in this place as a, an ordinary man like you or I, or if it's in this place as only harpsichord, or that place as only violin. Well, I think there you exaggerate that. There are schools. There, was, yeah. uh, there is the purest school, but that goes back a long time. Uh, Wanda Landowska, whom I admire immensely, was famous for once saying to, to somebody, um, okay, my dear, you play Bach your way, and I'll play him his way. Which is well, silly. People who say, which which is silly. silly. Yeah. I mean, she was a wonderful musician, but, but where did she? Yeah. I don't know. We got that. Individualistic. No, I think I, I, I'm sorry because I, I'm Miss Turek, and I are old friends, and I admire her enormously. I, I have to take issue with that. I think that uh, this century, now our time, has actually, due to all of these mechanical situations, as well as live performances, but recordings and film and television, the rest of it has suddenly come to realize that Bach, the pinnacle of the Baroque, the whole interest that audiences have in the Baroque period, culminating with Bach and Handel, invites the spreading out of the Bach oeuvre in all kinds of ways, as some of the ones we've been talking about, I mean, by the mood th synthesizer, or by chamber music, or by jazz, or by whatever, has suddenly now become uh, a composer of enormous accessibility rather than uh, old-fashioned rigidity. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we have the advantage of this mix of live and mechanical performances to thank for this fact. I would like a you, second... Excuse me, in, then in this, how do you differ I, well, from Well, because it? if I understood you correctly, you were saying you think that nowadays Bach is being more proscribed for either the harpsichord, the organ, the uh, chamber music ensemble, or the, or, the, um, or the religious works. Yes, he is, and I think that is an error. I think that the 21st century will, will try to correct that. Ah, well, I wasn't clear about that when the way, the way you yeah, said it. That, I just wanted well, to make certain no, that we what, were... Yes, what I meant is that this is very much in our mentality. Do we get the 16th back in the 21st century? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to say that, that to, to take up a second what you, you, Mr. Page said uh, about the Stravinsky uh, uh, recording project because you, the point went by too quickly. It isn't that everybody has to do Stravinsky the way Stravinsky himself conceived the sound of his pieces. It is that there is the new dimension of what he felt to be uh, his it, way of doing it. It's just another It's another reference Another point. input, as they say. No, not on this program. <laughs> not as we say. <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, another reference point, um, and an important one, a new one, one of the, one of the assets of the, of the mechanical age in which we live. And hopefully, future scholars, future interpretive musicians will use it to the advantage that it obviously has in terms of helping them as they decide to re-explore uh, what they feel about the piece or pieces. And it would have been an extraordinary thing if we had had these mechanical helps on these points uh, earlier. Going all the way back. Going all the way back. Yeah. 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 We do have those occasional piano rolls of Debussy playing whatever mm -hmm. and uh, Vincent Dondi doing the same thing. And one <clears throat> even Brahms. Even Brahms, exactly. And one wonders whether or not, um, you know, that is in fact what they poked out on the paper as it went past the bellows. But yeah, in the recording, yeah. you know that it is, uh, it is what, uh, in the case of Stravinsky, it is what he orally felt he would like to hear. The I would like to add, if I may... You may in uh, 15 seconds. Y yes. Um, that additions from, oh, well, that go back already several hundred years, editions of works uh, indicate what we talk in a loose way of what the composer wants. And even where, in the case of Bach, he inserted very few uh, interpretive markings, especially in his keyboard works, uh, he did interpret quite a lot in the cantata 
uh, in the cantata works, and that is a great help, and that is very, very instructive to all of us. Thank you very much, Ms. Turek. Thank you very much, Dean Schuyler Chapin. Thank you very much, Mr. Tim Page of the New York Times, author of the Glenn Gould Reader.